A very warm welcome. Thank you so much for making time and joining us right here on CNBC Africa. It is a special and we're coming to you from Rwanda. My name as always is Eugene Anangwe. It is a talk that we're going to be focusing on the issue of greening our economies. It's been on the lips of many people, especially environmentalists who have been actually pushing for uh, governments and all those who are interested in actually ensuring that the environment is actually protected that you want a green economy do you want it as well talk to us at cnbc africa and you can also tweet me directly at i'm um, eugene and um, well, let me bring on board our panelists right here we have omoguaneza janet environment specialist with the rwanda environment management authority thank you for joining us on the program also with us all the way from Nigeria is uh, none other than Victor Tobena. And of course, he's from Sandra Ventures, all the way from Nigeria. Thank you for your time to talk to us today. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. And also with us is none other than Gayatari Gatri Data, CEO at the Naval. Thank you for joining us on the program. Thank you. You told us we should call you Gaia on this sure, program. Sure, no problem. No problem. Perfect. Thank you so much. We'll work with that. Kauta Mokoena, South Africa Ministry of Environment. Thank you so much for making time and joining us right in the program. And of course, you are the Director of Chemical Waste Policy Monitoring and Evaluation. Thank you for being with us. You're welcome and thank Let's you for kick, inviting me. Thank you. Let's kick start this particular conversation. And of course, we'll start from home. They always say East or West home is best. This issue of going green, what do we mean when we say we want to go green as our economies are concerned, as far as our economies are concerned? Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, green, yes, that's a good question because sometimes when you say green, people expect trees mm -hmm. around mm -hmm. and uh, it's not just trees it's not planting trees it's green being green is starting it's a lifestyle mm -hmm. for any anything that we do or we use mm -hmm. we I mean anything surrounding us yeah. can be greened yeah. if we want yeah. it's just a matter of commitment and the will for people to do starting from our household you can green your home you can green your home starting uh, you can have your lights uh, saving bulbs mm -hmm. that would cut off how much electricity you use. Mm -hmm. You are being green, you can use, cut on the how much water you use, you consume at your household level. You are being green, mm -hmm. you can, uh, I mean, there's so many things that you can do. So it's part of our life, it's, it's a, I call it a lifestyle. It's, it's a lifestyle. It's a lifestyle. It's a lifestyle. Victor, so from Nigeria, where you come from, how are the people back there getting plugged into this lifestyle of going green? I mean, it's a process. Mm -hmm. It's a process. It's definitely one that has been on for a while. But I think, the, what's the word to use? There's a huge momentum and a huge push towards it now mm -hmm. because people are slowly realizing without this, there may be no future. Mm -hmm. So essentially now people are trying to adapt a lifestyle at homes, yeah. at their businesses, yeah. thinking of little ways to start the contributions from them, mm -hmm. be it your personal carbon footprint, so the carbon footprint of the companies you work for, yeah. or even the processes. Like, for example, you see some farms that are now trying to look into biogas mm -hmm. because essentially the waste coming from their crop or let's say a poultry farm, the waste you're not doing anything with it. Mm. It could be used as fertilizer. Mm. Some of those waste could go into biogas to then power your facility. And what are you doing then? You're saving costs and you're helping the environment. Mm. So people are slowly realizing that going green is the way forward to preserve the environment. Mm. And also there could be a financial aspect to it. Whereas going green is not expensive. Yeah. You could actually have cost savings by going green. So then even the people that may not be too big on environments, mm -hmm. once they're here, you can save me money at home in the office. Mm -hmm. It makes it easier. Right. We'll interrogate that aspect of it not being expensive <laughs> in the course of this conversation. Yeah. But You're let wrong. me just jump into uh, uh, this, bringing Gaia on this from where you come from. Talk to us a bit about uh, whether we as environment specialists are the ones who are making it too complicated for ordinary people with as little background information on environmental matters to plug into this thing that Jeanette calls a lifestyle. Sure. Well, I think it's all about whether there's opportunities to engage in that lifestyle. Mm -hmm. So I think often, well, at least in the United States where I'm originally from, green is kind of everywhere. There's companies who have an entire industry and have a price markup to sell greener products. Mm. Seventh Generation is a great example of that. Yeah. It was actually interesting though, coming here, I've been here for five years, living in Rwanda for five years, mm. and people are amazed that anybody would spend more money on their toilet paper mm. because it was environmentally sustainable. Mm. 
And I think partially is that there doesn't really seem to be a market there yet for it, and that's partially just because maybe awareness is um, not yet ha hasn't yet caught up. Yeah. Um, I will be honest and say I think it's a small segment of the population in the United States yeah. that uh, really is willing to spend more money to be green. Right. And so, but I think what you said is exactly right. There are opportunities where it can be cheaper, mm. um, but I believe that there's other externalities at play from polluting the environment that are not priced into existing products that are unsustainable. Right. And and that will, I think, continue to hold back the process right. of greening. And, and so that means we need to actually um, create awareness so that people can be able to see those opportunities uh, that are, are available with going green. Kauta in South Africa, talk to us a bit about what is going on back there as far as greening the South African economy is concerned. Um, there's quite a lot that is taking place. I agree with my co-panelists mm -hmm. on the inputs they've made. But just to indicate that what is also important is the issue of circular economy, mm -hmm. because it says in the greening process, you do reuse of material, recycling of material, you reduce waste that is going to landfill. It's about diverting waste from going to landfill, mm -hmm. because in what you generally throw away, you reuse, um, in the process of reusing, mm -hmm. there is job creation, mm -hmm. there is enterprise or SMME development, mm -hmm. and at the same time, there is big environment environmental benefit, which is about waste diversion from going to landfill, which is the greening aspect. Yeah. But it goes beyond that in terms of secularity because uh, it says closed loop, let's not have products or material going to waste because waste is a resource. Let's keep it within the cycle. Let's keep it within the loop. Let's do something about waste. Mm -hmm. I want to read your thoughts, first of all, uh, uh, Jeanette. Back here in Rwanda, what is actually the government doing? What is actually policymakers doing? And everybody involved uh, trying to do so that uh, this thing doesn't just sound like an alien to locals. Um, I think the government have been doing a lot mm -hmm. in terms of uh, uh, facilitating or just including it. There have been so many uh, policies that have been put in place. We have uh, green growth and climate change resilience strategy, mm -hmm. which actually is supposed to guide all sectors mm -hmm. on how they can change the, the way they've been doing things, mm -hmm. what they should be doing to green their sectors. Mm -hmm. uh, so they are different if you go to agriculture sector, specific things that they will do to for greening or sustainable agriculture if you go to the energy sector. So all sectors have been guided so on the how. So guidelines are there? The, yes. But then, so how have <coughs> those guidelines been lifted from those beautiful papers to actualization? Uh, I would say it's a long journey, yeah. but I think we are getting there if we compare. I'm talking from the REMA perspective. Yeah. Uh, part of the REMA responsibilities to mainstream or to help other sectors integrate environment and climate change to their own plan strategies. Mm -hmm. And it's been going on so many years ago. And if I compare where they started and where they are now, I would say a good job is being done. Uh, because when it started, uh, some sectors would think it would be an additional budget for them to green their sector or to integrate environment and climate change to their, their strategies. But this time, they've realized that it's actually not additional budget. It's just changing the way they've been doing things. Yeah. Yeah, just. Uh, for example, if uh, the government have been promoting the energy, there are so many opportunities. It's not just bringing in the fossil fuel energy. We have opportunities in the solar energy, for example. Yeah. And the government been promoting uh, even private sector to invest in the solar energy. And maybe later on, after some researchers will even uh, enter into the geothermal energy. Mm -hmm. Those are green energy sources that and we have and yeah. opportunities yeah. we have. Yeah. So it's just a matter of looking at what you've been doing and see where it's been wrong and try to change. Yeah. So that's why when I said I said it's a matter of at household level, it's a, it's a lifestyle. It's a lifestyle. It's just changing your lifestyle. So even from the government perspective, it's changing. Mm -hmm. uh, we always tell our stakeholders that because we usually have different workshops and trainings with them that we are not telling you to just come up with different things. It's just you to change how you've been doing things. For example, if you're going to construct a road, just make sure the road you're going to construct, for it to be sustainable enough. Sustainable means for it to stay for longer, not just uh, investing how many billions in the road and then after five months when it rains, it's not there. The, wa the water 
you know, rushes out to the, the whole road, you just have to maintain where am I going to have the water? Yeah. Where will the water pass? Yeah. Uh, can I plant trees on the road, at least even to capture the carbon from the uh, emissions, the car emissions that will be passing on that road? Yeah. So it's, it's a normal thing. And uh, planting trees is not something that you would need a big investment. Mm -hmm. I think uh, it's something that Anyone can do. Anyone can do. Yeah. So Jeanette, I, I want to put you on the spot a bit. Uh, allow me to do so. I don't know if you will, but no, it's no, a difficult no. one. Yes. You've really responded really well on what the government is doing to actually ensure that uh, mm. this greening uh, of our economies is actually uh, sustainable and, and, and achievable. Yes. What is the government not doing? Uh, I would say that uh, I think in the past, the involvement of private sector was not that much or visible, if I may call it that way. Mm. Uh, probably the government thought, you know, when the issue comes, it's like uh, when you have a home and an issue comes, mm. as a head of the home, you feel like it's your responsibility to act quickly. Yeah. So the private sector was not involved that much, mm. but now we've realized that without private sector involvement, yeah. it will not be achievable. Be so we're trying to see how private sector can be involved. Right. Fair yes. enough. Let's yeah. get to Victor here. Yeah. Victor, same Thank question. You. What is actually being done back in Nigeria and also by you as, as a young entrepreneur yourself to actually uh, support in this endeavor of greening uh, the economy of Nigeria, for instance? So, I mean, let me start from the government side because mm -hmm. that's a little bit, that's, I only have a little bit of information <laughs> yes. being private sector and all. Yes, yes. From the government, I mean, there are policies yeah, in place and they're trying to enforce like the extended producer's responsibility. Mm -hmm which essentially also ties in with the circular economy. Mm. It's a way to get producers to pay a small levy for, in this case, electronic waste, for the electronic devices or equipment that they, they bring into the country. And why is that? So basically, that levy can be used to support different e-waste recyclers in the country. Because that way, there's more motivation for them to actually go for it, because it could be an expensive process. Yeah. For my company, I work, uh, I work with Sonry Ventures. Uh, German Nigerian venture, where we're a venture builder and we set up companies with sustainability at the core. Mm -hmm. So it's basically a green company. So we think of ideas and we look for companies that meet our tripod. Mm -hmm. Three main things. Essentially, number one, it needs to be, how do I put it, it has to have significant environmental impact. Mm -hmm. Number two, socioeconomic impact, so creation of jobs, improving the livelihood of people, being able to train the upcoming youth and everyone. And number three, economic returns, because it's still a company at the end of the day. Yeah. So we, I, we try to think of ideas or companies that meet our tripod, and then we set companies up and run them. To date, we have two main flagship companies. There's Daystar Power and Green Compass Recycling. But my focus now will be on Daystar Power, which has made the most progress so far, which is a solar company, renewable energy. In this case, what do we try to do for greening our economy? In Nigeria, we have I think the amount spent for power generation by generators is about 14 billion naira. No, 14 billion US dollars, pardon my mistake. Essentially, we have identified that our economy cannot be built on the back of diesel and petrol generators. Sure. So essentially, what we try to do, we have small and mid-sized solar hybrid solutions that we provide to commercial clients and now in some rural areas as well. And what are we trying to do essentially? We're trying to reduce carbon emissions. We're trying to increase profitability of these companies. If you have an SME or a micro SME, a huge cost for them is power. And with having to rely on these generators, it makes it harder for them. It's harder for the economy to thrive. And now, so let me give you a good example with the banking industry. A typical bank, let's say they consume about 15,000 to 20, 25,000 liters of diesel every year. That's a lot. With our solutions, we're able to eliminate that. So basically, that equates to about 50 um, tons of CO2 in a year. Yeah. And think of Nigeria, where you have about 6,000 to 8,000 banking branches and up to 10,000 ATMs. So we're looking at, as with this type of systems, you can potentially save over 250,000 tons mm. of carbon emissions every year. Yeah, but this is this is this is this sounds amazing when you when you, when you say it this way. Uh, but what I want to ask you, probably for you to share with our viewers, mm -hmm. is is um, the process of actualizing that really great idea. That really sounds amazing. That sounds that like, wow. If we manage to do this, look at the amount uh, of lives we can save. Look at the amount of greening we can actually do. How far are you from actually reaching this? Are these banks taking in these ideas? Are are people buying in? 
it's a process. Yeah. People are buying in. We've signed up some of the leading banks in Nigeria and in Africa generally. Yeah. And apart from banks, we also operate in the agricultural space and the industrial space. Literally, almost any commercial clients we can serve based on the engineering bes- um, behind it. Yeah. So people are taking it in. It's just, it's a process because of some factors that we need to account for. So for example, in the past, I would say, there has been the technical know-how hasn't always been there, one. And also, as the years have gone by, prices for these equipment have become more competitive. So three, four years ago, I wouldn't be here talking about this yeah. because it was a different ball game. But right now, prices are competitive and people are slowly finding how to get this done. So for us, we found a way to combine everything. We have good relationships with suppliers of this equipment. We understand the environment. I mean, I'm Nigerian, I've been there for a while. Even our other co-founders have been in the country for about 10, 15 years. So we understand the environment, we understand different industries. We know their needs. I can talk a lot about banking because my dad was a banker. Uh, One of the co-founders was a banker as well. And I can easily tell you in a bank, one of their top two operating costs is human capital and power. So that's just to give you an idea. So when we walk into a bank, we're trying to explain to them, we can save you cost. We can now save you some of the stress you deal with. So let's let me break down some of the hassles. Sorry, I'm going to go on for a lot. Mm-hmm. Let me break down some of the hassles of dealing with a petrol or a diesel generator. You're dealing with the cost of acquisition. That's cost of capital that you could be using for something else. Yeah. You're dealing with procurement, trying to purchase diesel every week or every month. You're dealing with maintenance and then the inefficiency of a mechanical equipment. So when you break down all those costs and we tell them we have solutions where we're able to provide you clean, renewable energy. We're able to reduce your cost savings by up to 50, 20% of power costs. That's significant for them. We're able to give you control because we're giving you a one-stop shop. In addition to giving you equipment, we will run everything for you. Just give us fixed monthly payments and we handle everything. So you're taking off multiple segments and just saying a one-stop shop for it. Talk to us about how this is actually making it difficult for environmentalists and people who are really pro-green feel when, 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 when top leaders like President Donald Trump say what they say about these issues. Yeah, I mean, well, I think if, if someone doesn't think it's a problem, then there's not a problem to solve. Uh-huh. So I think it really starts there. Then yeah. Of course, of course, that makes an impact. Like if there's, if no, if, if there's a denier that this is something that's going to be catastrophic yeah. for our economies, for our families, for future generations, yeah. then and not willing to do anything to solve the problem, then I think it's, it's quite clear. And the other thing is that um, really government does have a pretty critical role to play in this equation. Mm-hmm. And the reason for that is that it is the public that is going to bear most of those costs mm-hmm. of non-action. Mm-hmm. So for example, if you have a very polluting industry like the cement and concrete industry, I work in affordable yeah. floors that are much more sustainable than cement, so it's yeah. an industry I know well. Yeah. Um, it's responsible for 8% of global carbon emissions, mm. 5 to 8% depending on, um, depending on the report. And as a result, that means that there's air pollution, there's water pollution, there's going to be climate mitigation measures that we're going to have to take by building additional infrastructure Mm -hmm. to protect Mm -hmm. our families and Mm -hmm. our communities. Mm -hmm. All of those are costs that someone is not now paying for when they purchase a bag of cement. Mm -hmm. Those are costs that the public is the one that's going to have to pay for later. When I sell my affordable and sustainable floors, 100% of the cost of that floor, because our carbon impact is basically nothing, Mm. is borne by the customer. Mm. So there's not additional externalities to pay for. So if you were to price in everything that goes into that bag of cement, then it would be twice as expensive. Mm. And then, of, and so right now our floors happen to be cheaper than cement, it's about a third of the price of cement because um, there's no energy really involved in making our floors. But that's not the case for like um, an epoxy paint, mm. for example. Mm. There are versions of green epoxies, bio epoxies, mm. using various types of an, um, uh, sorry, vegetable resins, uh, vegetable sources rather, to make their resins. Super expensive though, so not quite cost competitive. They would be if there was a carbon tax yeah. or if there was some way to price in all of those additional costs that will happen in the longer term. Right. That's when we'll become competitive. And with government inaction to do that, mm-hmm. there's no other body that could possibly 
impose that tax and really level the playing field for green businesses versus non-green businesses. Right. Because it's I'm, cash. It's actual money. It's not just, you know, feel-good things yeah. about let's save our environment. It's yeah. like there are real costs associated with an action. Right. There's been always this perception that those are of higher costs compared to the traditional stuff that we've always been using. And so, uh, you know, making people shift, I mean, or, or maintain status quo. They maintain buying what they've always been buying every day. If someone was to tell you nothing against anything herbal, they, if, if, if there's any, it's herbal uh, toothpaste, it's herbal soap, they've always felt that that attracts an extra cost because it has this special component in them. How is this affecting the drive for people to actually take in or buy into this kind of initiatives that are green in nature in terms of uh, the environment protection. Yeah, it makes it uncompetitive. Mm. If greener products are more expensive, of course they're uncompetitive on yeah. the market, yeah. period. Yeah. So again, if there's there's a small segment of the population that's probably willing to pay extra, mm -hmm. uh, but there's many people that are not able to pay, sure. especially in a country like Rwanda, which still has quite a number of people who are still mm -hmm. living in extreme poverty. Mm -hmm. We're not going to ask them, can you pay extra for this like environmental soap? It's ridiculous yeah. to even think that that's an option. Mm. But if you create incentives for innovation and say that if you do find some way to make a greener soap, mm. then you'll be rewarded for that in tax breaks. Mm -hmm. Or you'll be penalized if you don't with mm. tax hikes or mm. a carbon tax or something mm. like that. Mm. So that, that's how I think you actually make it all happen, is you, you make the incentives such that the innovation is driven in that direction. Right. Let's talk to our good friend, Kauta. He's actually from government, sitting next to you. And you just spoke a lot about government institutions. Uh, why is it difficult to actually just see this from government perspective and actually say, you know what, we are ready to actually uh, shed off some, seed some power in terms of, uh, you know, incentives for these people who are coming up with these beautiful ideas that are going to support our green economy strategies. Why is it difficult from a government perspective for this to happen? Uh, from Monday um, up to yesterday and today, yeah. so far the discussions at the um, forum has been around uh, the financial institutions saying there is funding available yeah. and those that need funding says we don't know where to get funding. Yeah. Uh, so which makes the issue of, of funding um, to be um, an issue or one of the issues, but not as critical as, as, as the enabling environment. Mm -hmm. Because in terms of envir enabling environment, that's where government comes in, mm -hmm. in terms of policies and legislation. For instance, in South Africa, we have the National Waste Management Strategy mm -hmm. that uh, provides a framework, a policy framework for greening to take place. And at the same time, we have National Environmental Management Act, which talks to now in the waste sector, how do you enable the beneficiation of material yeah. uh, from there yeah. uh, in terms of waste, be it uh, plastic, paper, glass, etc., organic waste, depending on that, which people will be interested in recycling. For instance, research tells us that in a town of, uh, of, of electronic waste, there is more gold. Um, then you would find in the um, iron ore that you'll mine from a particular mine. So it means there's more opportunities in waste recycling in terms of economic contribution, mm. uh, job creation, and at the same time uh, for participation <coughs> by everyone because uh, the, 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 there is a resource out there that we normally don't see as a resource. Now that you it. know that that resource is there, yeah. how much of seeing and acting to actually provide opportunities have you done in South Africa, for example? Um, last year, we hosted um, part of the presidential programs, what we called Operation Pagisa, Chemicals and Waste Economy, which talks about doing things fast. It's a programmatic approach that says um, specialists, uh, practitioners in waste, uh, government, civil society, academia, industry come to one room and look at key critical areas for interventions mm. uh, uh, into challenges that can be turned into opportunities. Yeah. So we've identified a number of opportunities 
for economic contribution, growth, but also enterprise development, because that's where you can find the growth aspect coming into play, more generally from what will be known as environmental protection. Yeah. But we're seeing growth, we're seeing economic contribution from that as well. Right. So what, what I mean, most, most people feel that probably government institutions or leaders uh, in government holding these positions do not really understand these things. That is why they do not actually take the appropriate actions. You'll find that their priorities seem to be, uh, you know, misplaced. Uh, instead of incentivizing these very important items or things, they're incentivizing others that really would not make a lot of sense when it comes to that. Talk to us a bit about what happens in those boardroom meetings, in those discussions when policy formulation is happening so that those who have this perception might probably understand what really makes people like uh, those in government not actually uh, create these incentives that they so badly want. Uh, thank you so much. Actually, like I mentioned, you, you asked me before, mm. what is the government have been not doing, mm. what they've been not doing. Mm. Uh, like I mentioned, I think uh, at the start, the government was trying to put up policies and you know strategies to see how this can be achieved. Uh, but now realize that it will not be achieved without involvement of private sector. Yeah. So the move is going now towards the private sector and a lot of things are, are happening. Uh, for example, if you look at the, 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 the industrial sectors, they've been put a program, the cleaner production program, mm. which is supposed to help uh, the industries on how to shift from you know, uh, non-green industries to green industries. Yeah. And this is not only going to actually help, I think uh, he mentioned how actually, uh, the, the only issue usually that uh, people haven't realized, uh, that they usually think uh, going green or being green, it's too expensive. Mm -hmm. Sometimes, yes, the upfront uh, uh, cost or the capital is high, mm -hmm. but at the end, you, you really get a big return. So from the government perspective, actually, we have a fund like a green fund for NERA. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it has different windows. It has one window is for private sector. Yeah. So it, uh, from the side, it can either give you a, a grantee, mm -hmm. depending on how the project is, mm -hmm. the innovation that involves, uh, how much impact it's the, your project or your idea is going to create, yeah. Uh, also contribute to the economy of the country, yeah. or it comes in as a credit, as from the credit line at a very low interest rate. Mm -hmm. So there's interest, uh, sorry, there are interest, there are very many opportunities that government have been putting in place, mm -hmm. but probably the private sector are not yet there. Mm -hmm. Yes, I would say, I think if you ask for NERA, so far they've dispersed around I don't know if it's uh, probably around 5% mm -hmm. of what they're supposed to give to private sector. Yeah. This but is because it, people are not actually coming to apply for this. Yes, people are not trying to, you know, they are not looking out for the opportunities. Yeah. And I think uh, that what they are trying to do is to raise awareness for people to know that there are so many opportunities around. Yeah. Uh, if you attended some of the sessions or the forums that happened, that different, not even a local, you know, institutions or funds that would help, but if there are even some of international mm -hmm. uh, funds yeah. that every country has the opportunity that they can tap in as an opportunity from different areas. Yeah. So from the government perspective, uh, they're trying to see, uh, for example, a new environmental policy that it will be in pro uh, you know, developed that mm -hmm. probably in a few months will be uh, approved and gazetted. Mm -hmm. uh, trying to see how to, in a way of discouraging uh, Non green, for example, for because we realize that uh, uh, some of the uh, economic uh, activities that are happening, people are not really ready to shift yeah. because they think this is cheap. Mm -hmm. But when the government looks on the other side, the inf impact or the consequences that will come mm -hmm. after, mm -hmm. it will be costly than what is being, you know, put up, put up right time. now. Yeah, yeah. So some of the, the, the taxes will be imposed yeah. on some of the products yeah. so that they so can that discourage and then the also um, encourage some of the products. For example, if some of the solar equipments are tax exempted, I mm -hmm. think. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's, it's a way of encouraging people to start, you know, adapting looking, this new adapting new. news. New so style. there are different opportunities coming up. Yeah. And I think the government has started involving the private sector. Yes, they've been, but trying to see if 
they even the private sector is ready to move where they are to to shift to the next yeah, yeah into a different perspective right. because Victor. they've been thinking it's too expensive it's too expensive i yeah. hear from victor how he feels uh, talk to me about uh, that paradigm shift that is needed for private sector to even start coming in to finance uh, these kind of green projects that people are coming up with today. I mean, I think it starts with building trust mm -hmm. between the public sector and private sector, yeah. which how is that trust going to be built? By working together more. A lot of times you see public sector trying to, like she said, be the head of the house and just handle everything themselves. But you need to, I think now that shift is, is there where they're actually realizing we need the support of the private sector. Right. So we so, need to see governments deliberately uh, getting hands off certain things so that they leave private sector to come in there. Uh, the best way to phrase it would be more of creating an enabling environment uh -huh. for the current private sector and then for more people to actually join the private sector. When you create that enabling environment, it makes it perfect. So for our company, Sun Ventures, mm -hmm. especially with Daystar Power, when I don't, I don't think we want to take over every bank in Nigeria, mm -hmm. part of our obligations that we impact that we put on ourselves essentially is to try to foster an environment whereas other players can join the market as well. Mm -hmm. Because at the end of the day, one of the main goals in our tripod is environmental impact. Mm -hmm. So I do see what you mean, whereas you have cases where a private sector company is only focused about its, pro its own profitability. Mm -hmm. And I do agree that you, that may be the case, but at least in our company. What we try to do is, apart from do our own job in terms of reducing carbon emissions, yeah. promoting renewable energy yeah. options, yeah. e-waste recycling, we also try to create an enabling environment the little way we can. Obviously, public sector has a better job of doing that, but how do we create an enabling environment? One, awareness. Mm. We create and try to host events to let people know these are the available options. These are companies that are doing it, for example, us, and this is our success rate. This is how it works. Yeah. Another, t another option or another way we get it done is success. The more we get things done, the more trust is built and is seen in the public sector. So when the public sector can actually see private sector companies getting it done, then they are more incentivized yeah. to actually support them because they see, okay, these guys are actually real players. Yeah. And, and so we can actually give them more support. Exactly. And thirdly, it's yeah. about the hustle. It's plain and simple, the hustle, mm. being aggressive in how you get things done. Mm. Mm. So, for example, you can sit down and complain from now to tomorrow about the public sector's contribution. Mm. You can complain about all the issues that are there. It's always going to be tough. It's always going to be challenging. Okay, so we're going to take a very short break right about now. When we come back, we have that conversation moving forward on the issue of greening our economies. How possible is this? What needs to be done? Is this just talk and no action? Will we do it as governments? Is your government actually working on that? Talk to us at CNBC Africa or at I'm Eugene at Nangwe. We'll see you on the other side of the break. Stay with us. Thank you so much for still being with us. This is CNBC Africa, where we are fast in business worldwide. This is a CNBC Africa special. Our focus, greening our economies. How possible is this? And of course, we're talking about how each and every component of our institutions can actually play their role in achieving this. Um, my name, as always, is Eugene. Adangwe. Now, let's carry on this conversation. Before we went for the break, we were definitely looking at what needs to be done to fast track the whole idea of actually greening our economies. Should we implore or should we see governments imploring the carrot or the stick? Carrot meaning incentives, stick being punishment, punitive measures. Let's hear from you, Gaia. What would work for us? What would work for our economies so that we can speed up this particular process? Well, both is the obvious answer, but I think we can start with the carrots. Yeah. I think that there's ways that um, that we can encourage the type of innovation that's actually required. Mm. And a lot of that, we talked a bit about financing and that gap, but a lot of these projects are just longer term. Mm. Tesla, a very famous company, very renowned company, made its first profitable quarter last quarter. And I think they started in 20, 2003. Mm -hmm. So it's been 15 years, and Tesla 
just had a profitable quarter now. Mm. So sometimes it just takes some time to create the new normal. Mm. And sometimes it just takes time for this innovation to actually catch up. Mm. And it's not just even about the product innovation. A lot of these things require brand new business models that have never been done. Mm. At Earth Enable, my company, we've literally had five business models in the last four years. Yeah. Just because in order one to doesn't figure, work, another one has to be exactly. Actually. So you just have that. Also requires time. <laughs> that requires you know. So things like grants. Like yeah. I love the fact that Fenerwa gives the private sector grants. Mm. That is not that. That's a novel concept. And when you think about it, mm. like why would you give a why would you subsidize someone else's returns later? Yeah. Exactly for this reason. Mm -hmm. So give them the carrots, see what happens, mm. and then I think there probably will come a time. I I personally believe we're a little too late, to be honest. Mm. I'm curious about how the government people feel about this, <laughs> uh, but um, I, I believe it's too late. I believe that, especially with the new reports that have just come out in the past few weeks, yeah. it's a much worse situation than we realized. Right. Um, and that, that information now needs to result in quicker action, yes. otherwise we'll all really be in trouble. Right. Kauta. Very true. Because we don't seem to have much time left uh, to actually implement this particular uh, one of the SDG goals. 2030 is just peeping at us around the corner, and we don't have much time. On the two options, carrot and a stick, I'll say uh, we need a mix. We need both. Uh, for instance, in South Africa, previously when the plastic carrot bags were introduced, they used to be for free. Mm. But uh, over time, because they became flowers uh, that were all over on the trees, along the roads, mm. and in the landfill sites, um, for those that are land, uh, licensed. So we introduced the levy such that when you go to the retailer, you're no longer getting it for free, but to pay for it. It's a, it's a deterrent from throwing away. It also encourages positive behavior and good mm. behavior and green behavior in that mm. as opposed to throwing away, you keep it, you reuse your bag, you collect a few, you take them to the supermarket next time when you go, because we know it's at the cost. Mm. There is time where you find that um, people get used to uh, and with the increase in, in, in wealth, uh, they, 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 they still throw away. Mm. So what government does is to, intro, is to increase a bit that um, levy so that um, if it goes up, it serves as a deterrent. You yeah. won't throw it again, yeah. but you keep on uh, resuming. It encourages recycling. Yeah. Seeing that plastics is a problem that ends up in the oceans, water bodies, and get consumed yeah. by the um, uh, marine um, species, which ends up in in yeah. our yeah. Uh, bodies, unfortunately. Yeah. So, 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 keratinistic mix is, is is quite a positive one, and um, in that area as well. Yeah, compliance and enforcement is very important mm -hmm. because whatever systems and policies that are there need yeah. to be monitored. Mm -hmm. uh, we need to ensure that there's compliance and the enforcement side to it. In South Africa, we have um, dedicated environmental inspectors to monitor um, environmental crimes and to take them further. Uh, through the necessary processes on cases where the stick or strict term measures are supposed to be implemented. But uh, the issue of, 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 of awareness raising, yeah. one can never overemphasize it. So hence we have developed what we call chemicals in our in we strategy, awareness strategy, which has been adopted at presidential level, is now under the hashtag Tumamina programs. So it's now hashtag Tumamina Clean Green Deeds program, mm. uh, where at presidential level, the need for cleanups, which involves the public, yeah. the community, has been uh, identified, and now everybody needs to follow suit and participate in the cleanups. And in that way, you're recovering the waste, you're recovering the material that will go as an input into the different production processes mm. by small enterprises, by big companies who are doing waste recycling and hence contribute to recycling economy and greening of our economy. Perfect. If I may, yes, on yes, that, yes. Just take for the carrot. Yes. yes, I agree. It has to be both sides. Yes, you, you have to encourage people and support where necessary as a government. Mm -hmm. But sometimes as a government, of course, being in charge of the whole, mm -hmm. you know, 
population, there are certain decisions you have to. At some point. Yes, yeah. not hard one, but uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah, to discourage, <laughs> to discourage them. Right. Yeah. Because, you know, Rwanda is a country that actually has been on the move in many, many aspects. Mm-hmm. It's a country that actually has risen from from, from, from ashes, literally. The, the 1994 genocide against the Tutsis is a country that now wants to catch up with the rest of the world in its own unique way. And 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 all of us are saying that we need to industrialize. Mm-hmm. And with industrialization comes their missions. So how is Rwanda actually sticking and staying grounded to actually follow the path of ensuring sustainability and ensuring that even if we're industrializing, mm-hmm. it is green industrialization? What sort of tricks? What can the world learn from Rwanda in this line? It's hard to balance, mm-hmm. I might say that. Uh, yes, we want the investors to mm-hmm. come in and invest. We want to have as many as industries as we can. But at the same time, we need to keep our environment safe because we don't want to have investors coming in and just uh, giving us a little bit like a trash that we know in a few years it's going to become an issue. Mm-hmm. So we'd rather not have it and just have few that we know will not have consequences back to our population. Uh, so REMA, of course, works with the RDB and I think if you go to RDB, there's a uh, department in charge of environmental impact assessment that usually usually used to be part of REMA. They're supposed to review what the, the projects or the investments that are coming in, mm-hmm. try to get the investors. But we still need to work mm-hmm. more uh, to make sure that that mm-hmm. doesn't happen. Yeah. Uh, for example, recent we just had a session with uh, the industrial owners in the Kigali Free Economic Zone. Mm -hmm. We were just telling them, showing them the new environmental laws and the the air quality uh, laws that have been coming up Mm -hmm. to show them that as the government, yes, we do want you to produce. Uh, We want to have so many products. We don't want to keep on buying so many products out of the country. We Mm -hmm. want to produce more in country, but not to the extent of destruction of our environment. Mm -hmm. If somebody wants really to go green, the institution, REMA, not even REMA, if you go to RDB, there'll be at least people there to guide you. Mm-hmm. So at the end of the day, it affects, whatever affects environment. It affects all of us. All of us, right. and directly. Right. It's not like it's something that would say, oh, to affect another person. It comes to us directly. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So we, you wouldn't support something that you know uh, five years down, you know, it will affect you back. So what you I'm know? reading from what you're saying is that rules have been set, and, and, and actually uh, enforcement is, is really key and strongly being strongly done uh, from the government. Uh, yes, enforcement of is it's a continuous, uh-huh. you know. Uh, there are usually people who usually want to pass uh-huh. on the side uh-huh. and it's the role of the government to, you know, keep reminding those ones. So that's why we usually have different forums with, uh, you know, private investors mm-hmm. just to show them, okay, we, we really appreciate what you're doing, but please, Again, we remind you, you shouldn't go beyond this and this. Right. These are the rules, these are the rules. The new environmental actually will penalize the, the polluters more mm. uh, than the ones we had. Right. So, right. and it comes back to the government when you usually, something is messed up, the government to clean up has to invest yeah. a lot. Right, right, yeah. I see that. Victor, yeah. she talks about a very important thing, uh, and that is the issue of those rules. But um, we have economies uh, in East Africa, perfect examples. We've seen in Kenya, for instance, uh, you know, the demolition of, uh, you know, buildings that had been put up on what government says is riparian land. Um, we have seen, or even heard, it's on the record, the president of Uganda just recently at the Blue Economy Conference in Nairobi telling uh, the public uh, or the people that he was actually addressing there that the government of Uganda, Uganda is literally bribing people who have actually in uh, put up infrastructure on wetlands, bribing them to leave nicely because we have to actually make them leave. These are things that are happening. And so talk to me a bit about role of governments in ensuring that these rules are not do not create room for corruption, do not create room for, you know, more damage than uh, than this is, is expected. What should be done? How do we deal with this? So to get your question right, mm-hmm. how can the government enforce it mm-hmm. at the same time minimize corruption? Yeah. Oof. <laughs> corruption, corruption. <laughs> so essentially, enforcement, there's no, how do I put it? 
Enforcement is enforcement. Yeah. If you set a rule, you have to enforce it. How do you enforce it? I think you enforce rules in two ways. One, by making sure the rules are being followed. And two, by actually penalizing people who don't follow it. Mm -hmm. So to enforce some of the policies that are being set up, they may need to actually set up agencies to actually monitor or track these things down, or they may need to assign them to already existing agencies to actually go and monitor. Because yeah. if you set a rule, you try to implement it, and there's no one actually checking about, no one's going to follow it. Yeah. And then if they find out you can check it and nothing's going to happen or the penalty is really minimal, yeah. if there's no incentive there. No so sometimes there's a lot of cases where you put policies and we want to believe everyone is just going to follow the new policy. Yeah. That's it. That's a perfect world. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, we're not in a perfect world yeah, yeah. where sometimes you need to actually put um, penalties in place. So when you actually catch people with agencies you've set up, so that's step one, mm -hmm. people to actually go around checking it. And then step two, mm -hmm. how do you punish them? Or what's the penalty there for not doing it? Mm -hmm. So essentially, if they can focus on those two parts, that's how you see people obeying those policies you set up. In terms of corruption, the, it starts from within, it starts from each individual. Apart from the governments, it starts with us actually not having the mindset where we feel we can just bribe thing, yeah. or do something else. We also ha want to try to do the right thing. So I won't put it all on the government. In terms of the government, how they can try to minimize that is essentially who you put in power, who you put in charge of what. You get someone who's qualified for the role because, I mean, the word qualified could be used loosely, but who's qualified yeah. Yeah. for the for role the you're role. giving yes. them? Yes. Exactly. And then, secondly, you look for someone who has character. Yeah. So essentially, if you have someone who's qualified, people would respect the person, or should, because they should have a proven track record. And they can actually, listen. They, you listen to them speak, you see them, you know that they know what they're talking about, you know you can trust them. Mm -hmm. And then if they have integrity or character, sometimes people may not try to actually be corrupt with them. Or if they try and they see this person isn't budging, then they know. But once so you they have... They will never want to actually try. They will never want to try. Right. And if you have someone, sorry, with integrity, <laughs> who, if they try, yeah. they penalize the person. Or it comes out that this person tried to do this and this is what was seen to happen. You find a way to, you find out corruption starts going down because they know they can't just get away with it. Right. I think part of it is that it kind of feels like there's two sides, like there's the environmentalist side mm. versus the mm, profit mm, side. Mm, mm. And I think just trying to find ways that everyone can realize that we really are on the same team here, y'all. Like at the end of the day, your long-term profits are going to be sacrificed, yeah. period. Mm. That is going to happen. Mm. And I think a lot of the incentives set up in society are very short-term. And so, yeah, who cares if I pollute this, that, and whatever else? And who cares if there's an oil spill here? Because it'll be more expensive in the short term to clean that up. Mm. But then really understanding and quantifying and seeing how in the long run, I think companies that get ahead of this game are going to be so much better off because they're going to have an advantage. They're mm. going to have a f first mover's advantage. Mm. So when those policies do come in place, because I do think this is going to become urgent yeah. quickly, yeah. and we're going to see it happening. We're already seeing it happen. 10,000 houses fell down in Rwanda mm. last rainy season mm. from insane amounts of rain. Mm. So that's all, it's already urgent. And I think the policies will catch up very quickly, mm. and companies that have already started making the right moves are going to be the ones that win. Right. So I think companies, if they start having that mindset, then they'll realize that everyone really is aligned here because there's not going to be any planet for you to make money on right. if we don't do something right now. Right. It's good that you already start uh, making us look ahead of this particular conversation. And of course, it's it's our cue to actually start picking our closing remarks. And I'll start with, uh, with Mokoye now. Um, uh, what would we need then uh, moving forward uh, to actually realize this? How do we ensure that we create opportunities and make them known to people who are investors eager to actually jump into these particular opportunities uh, concerned. Where do, we move, where do we go from here? Green growth and green economy is about the environment, is about development. So key to that is sustainable development. Mm -hmm. It's about the needs of the current generation mm -hmm. without compromising the ability of future generations to take decisions on how they want to make a living yeah. at that time. So whatever decision that you take now need to take cognizance of the fact that in future mm -hmm. um, 
there will be a need for the generations at the time to look back and say those decision makers, those policy makers yeah. make good decisions or not so good decisions. So hence, it is very important to look at issues of social economic impact assessments on policy making on projects because um, together with environmental impact assessment, you need to weigh the, 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 the pros and cons, the positives and negatives of a particular decision um, on a particular project. Then in that way, we are able to say, irrespective of whatever benefit that is being provided there, if the future benefits are less, you are able to, to balance the two, which, which, which makes it important to look at, at sustainability of a particular project and at the same time globally to say what our contribution yeah. and commitment to global treaties yeah. um, such that as part of our greening process and that smaller and regional project is able to help us achieved, uh, achieve our um, objectives and commitments, for instance, on climate change, yeah. on sustainable development, we talk to uh, sustainable development goals, uh, which are very important, largely because all stakeholders need to play a role, industry, yeah. um, government, civil society, uh, we all need to be part of this for greening to take place and green growth, together with circular economy and extended risk producer responsibility to take place. Right. Uh, Jeanette, you had the honors of starting, opening. I yes. want to give you the honors of actually closing this. Uh, the, if the whole of this achieving the green economy or green growth, it's, it's, it's a commitment of everyone. It's a commitment of every player that is involved. Uh, but it, to, it has to start with you. So if you don't start it, the next person will say, okay, he's not doing it or she's not doing it, so I'm not doing it. So I think from the Rwanda perspective, as a country, as a responsible country that is responsible for its uh, population, they are ready to do it, mm -hmm. and then without looking at what others are doing. Mm -hmm. So you do your part and wait for others to do. And uh, in this world we are in, it's about partnerships. Yeah. And uh, like he mentioned, the SDGs, they encourage partnership. Government, private sector, continents, that's why you saw like uh, African, trying to encourage African countries coming together to, to achieve the green Africa that the communities in Africa would want to have. We don't want to have our future generation, grand-grandchildren complaining like our grand-grandparents were irresponsible. Mm. So it starts with the government, of course. Yeah. It has to commit itself regardless of what the others, others think. think. Others think. Yeah, and it's not about headlines with whatever, yeah. because at the end of the day, we know the profit of it. Right. Yeah, and uh, from the airport example, I think uh, they explained to you, it's, mm. it's, going, it's going to be cheaper, the cost of having the airport to be cheaper than the usual airport they would put up. So it's a profit on one side yeah. to the government, and at the same time, we know there will be no threat to the communities of Rwanda. Right. Yeah. Janet, thank you so much for actually taking us home. I hope we are okay if, if, if she actually takes us home because that's all the time we had for this particular conversation. Uh, unless if you have something really burning, you want to just throw in. <laughs> um, it's safe to indicate that it's uh, for the environment. And while it's for environment, for community, and it's for economic development, another important part that you get as feedback yeah. from industry and business people is not they are doing it because they are not doing it because they are forced. Yeah. They are not doing cleaner production and circular economy because they are forced or because the act says. Mm. But it makes business sense to them. Right. They are so able it should to make business sense. Certainly competitive advantage. Right. They are able to perform better than their competitors right. uh, when they adopt cleaner production as well as circular economy. Right. Gaia, you seem to want to have something to add. I would just I, I agree with you. I do think that the environment, though, does need to ensure that that is the case, mm -hmm. because I, I've, in, in some cases, energy efficiency mm -hmm. completely. Mm -hmm. Obviously, higher upfront costs, mm -hmm. smaller ongoing costs. Completely agree. Yeah. In other cases, because of these externalities, it is simply not the case that greener is cheaper. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's the that's the bit to make it make business sense. Mm -hmm. I do think that that that's it's required for the government to play a role. Right, they, 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 Victor. You want to add something? <laughs> and I mean, like I said, I always agree the government does have a role to play, but as a private sector individual, young entrepreneur, I can easily tell you, 
the role is also there for more private sector individuals to come in. Because look at me, yeah. I could have easily stayed back in the U.S. after school to work. Yeah. Yeah. But I came back because I grew up in Nigeria mm. with power outages. Mm. I come back, there's two power outages. Mm. Everyone is saying renewable energy is the future. Mm. And I'm thinking to myself, why the future? Why can't it be the present? Mm. So it's that type of respons- self-responsibility and wanting to actually make that impact and not yeah. just sitting around waiting for the government to do everything. That so you kind of keep just crying. Exactly. So you're coming back and just taking it upon hands yourself. Dirty. Yeah. Everyone talks so much about youth involvement. So it's, so I mean, it's, it's also up to us to actually want to come and take on these type of roles. You have seen the looks I got yesterday at the panel. Everyone was wondering. Mm. <laughs> Wondering how come this guy is here all the way from Nigeria, mm. but it's those type of things we need to actually try to change, change the topic, change the narrative. Mm. Not just saying you should be involved yeah. or we should yeah. do this change. It's not should be that. It's what should be going on now. Yeah. And where the government else comes in is also about giving people the opportunity, giving youth the opportunity to actually contribute directly. Perfect. Thank you so much. I think that's all the time we had for this particular conversation. I'm sure it will continue when we leave this particular <laughs> studio. But of course, thank you for making time and talking to us on this very important matter, right? Thank you. Of course, we want to say thank you so much also for watching and also being a part of the program. We have more of this kind of conversation lined up right here on CNBC Africa, where we are fast in business worldwide. As always, I'm Eugene. And Nangwe.